one of the themes of this book is memory and reflection and how that changes and adapts as we grow through our lives. And so I thought it might be interesting and very self-indulgent for me to talk about my first memories of Guy's work and how it came to me. And so for me, I was 15 years old, um, and I was reading the Fiona Bar Tapestry. And, um, and as I was reading it on the school bus, I was a country boy in the farm, uh, I would get so pulled into Guy's world um, that it became very visceral for me. And I remember distinct moments, like getting off the bus, and I was always the last stop, and I lived in the dark country, and I had to walk home about a, a mile through dark country, like no streetlights, no nothing. And it was right at the end of um, the summer tree, where the Svart Alfar and Rakoth is doing what he's doing. And I just remember so distinctly walking home with all the darkness around me and being 15 years old, my imagination completely tweaked by Guy's words. And I think I ended up running. <laughs> um, and then there was moments like with the Lions of al Rasan, where I was in my parents' RV uh, like a recreational vehicle, weeping on our summer road trip. And it occurred to me that as we've talked about the themes of this book, that Guy's own works and words have become part of my memories and my tapestry or my mosaic of what I have experienced in my life and how I've grown with them. And so I guess I could keep going on about this, but I guess that leads me to my first kind of question. I'm sure you are conscious of it. So when did that consciousness come of intertwining these stories through their own history of your books? They're, they're not, your books aren't a saga. Your books can stand alone. They have little groupings. But there is a world that resonates through them, and stories and characters. And I, I, quick question, how many people here have read one Guy Gabriel K book? Many Guy Gabriel K books. All Guy Gabriel K books. All right, great. So you all know <laughs> that feeling when you're reading it and you're like, oh my, that's, that's that person from, wait, is that, could it be? And you get that excitement, that, that resonance, which is one of the gifts of your storytelling. So when did that start manifesting for you? The, first of all, thank you. Uh, one of the things I'm going to say before I answer is how wonderful, as a reader myself, that feeling is when a book you read enters your own personal sense of self. When the books aren't just a distraction, a diversion, uh, a beach read, an airplane read, but they become part of the map of how we deal with the world. And I think every serious writer I know is trying to write the books that they would enjoy reading if somebody else wrote them. And so because of that aspiration as a reader, because I want that to happen to me, I'm trying to give that degree of engagement mm -hmm. for readers. Now, on the interweaving and intertwining, I'm going to give you a hard time. Because, no, not quite that. I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a difficult answer. The answer is that I have never seen the books as shaping or constituting a single, grand, unified field construct that they are individual stories. I have, for many of them, not all of them, stayed with the same near Europe in which many take place, including a brightness long ago. And that is, frankly, because I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I may be a Minnesota Vikings fan, but I'm still not a complete idiot. The idea 
of having your map and your broader outlines of a history and your religions already established and the ability to refer back to Chris's question, the ability to have books nod back at each other, to glance back. You may have caught some of you a reference to Serantium in the passage I read. But here's the thing, Chris, when you ask when did I become aware, I've never been thinking in terms of building this very large single structure. I'm more engaged in thinking about each individual book letting it function as a single, if I can do it, encompassing experience for the reader with, and the word or the phrase I always use is, with grace notes in a musical terminology, with a reference to something from another book of mine that the readers read that give that little smile or frisson on one or two instances, maybe a depth charge of intensity. But I absolutely don't want any reader picking up this book to feel that they're missing the central or even a central aspect of the novel if they haven't read Last Light of the Sun, which takes place as it happens in the same near Europe. And the way I've sometimes described it, Chris, is uh, somebody once said that River of Stars was uh, a sequel to Under Heaven. And they're both inspired by dynasties in China but they're 300 years apart. So it's like calling a novel about Victorian England a sequel to a novel about the 17th century. They're 300 years apart. They're both in England, but the two settings and the two frameworks are independent. So I'm more hung up than you might imagine on letting each book stand for itself, speak for itself. So further to that, why history? Why not the future? Why, why did you choose this? You know, you have this nice sort of that goes book back there, yeah? to my teenage years. That mm -hmm. goes back to the first books that obsessed me as a reader, the first nonfiction I started to read in detail. I can give you all of the quotes that many of you will know. Uh, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I love the comment that if we do not know our own history, we are endlessly children in our own lives. If we don't know the past of our culture and other cultures, we're thin on the ground, we're shallow in our ability to assess mm -hmm. what's happening to us and to our society. So history has been an obsession from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like to do is, and it's very much a part of this novel, is pair personal history, an individual's sense of their own life, the stories we tell ourselves about how and why we are what we are, the narratives we've constructed of our memories, that personal history also, for me, pairs with a culture sense of its history. What's the history of Canada? Well, it's disputed ground right now. It's ferociously contested ground with differing views of the significance or the greatness and the malevolence of many figures. What's the history of Europe? All of these stories we tell ourselves are constantly changing, whether as an individual or as a society. That fascinates me down to the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, and I, I think I can speak for all of the, the readers here who have read it, the way you've managed to manifest that um, also speaks to us in our modern time. And this is, what I, the next thing I want to talk about is the emotionality that you bring to your work. I've read fantasy all my life. Um, and I can honestly say that I have cried more reading this man's books <laughs> than any other author. Um, 
And I think that is not just your plot setting and how you tell your story, but also your own personal language, the poetry of how you write. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that because there are, there are formations that you use that I can almost feel building as I'm reading. I, I, it's, maybe it's because I've read so much of your work that it starts, it starts to already build and does anyone know what I'm talking about? You, you know, you can feel the pressure building and where, where did this particular style come from? Do you know? Can't answer. I don't know anyone who can answer where this style mm -hmm. comes from. I have joked for many years that my tombstone is going to read, he made people cry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've always, let me come at this this way. I've always hated the dichotomy that gets drawn when so many people talk about literature as between a page-turning adventure and well-written, character-driven, emotional novels. I've always disliked that harsh line, even though I acknowledge and could name books on one side or the other. From very early, my sense was that it's my job to try as best I can to deliver both sides of that equation, that I don't see an inconsistency between trying for a book that will keep you up all night to find out what happens next, mm -hmm. and a book that might make you grieve for a person or even a work of art when it, when it comes down. The idea that I want you engaged both intellectually and emotionally is ambitious and it can lead to failure. The one of the corollaries, one of the things that goes with ambition is that it means you're taking a risk. And it's easier to not take risks in life, in art, in almost any activity you can think of. It's easier not to because there's no guarantee of success mm. when you do that. But I can't get up in the morning and go to work in the morning without feeling that I'm pushing my own boundaries a little bit with each book. It's a long, solitary slog. And in fact, I was talking to another writer friend this afternoon. This evening, now, marks a remarkable transition that writers sometimes go to if they're lucky enough to have generous readers who want to meet them and talk to them. You go through a, a transition from being entirely by yourself, confronting your own inadequacy as a person and an artist. I can't make this work the way I want it to. A completely solitary process to an entirely public process of talking about what you do. That's like a slap on the face when you first begin it. This is the first night for a brightness long ago that we're launching it worldwide here. And I'm still figuring out, Chris, what it is I want to tell people about the book other than you tell me. I'm actually happier when readers tell me either personally or online or reviewing in various sites, which is infinitely more possible than it ever was, what the books mean to them, rather than my saying what I want it to mean to you. Mm -hmm. Let me keep going with this, and, and, but from the view of the, emotion, the, the, the singular emotionality that you bring to your work that I think is very unique and very difficult or to find out in, out in, especially in the fantasy genre. So for me, and this is almost a, I'm curious to see what you say about this as al almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, but my, because I read your work when I was young in very formative years, the way you 
presented love, romance, honor, pride, loss, sacrifice, had very power, had a very powerful impact on me. And I carried that with me, and it educated me on how I wanted to be. I remember the song of Arbonne, and the, 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 the two men, and I, sorry, I can't remember their names right now. Yeah. Not helping you. <laughs> no. but You're just, on your own, dude. I just remember the, the, the lead who was sort of suffered in silence the brilliance and in, uh, of, of, of his friend who was, I can't remember, the... Bertrand and Urchin. Thank you, thank you. Thank I'm you for too gentle, me. aren't I? He is. I could have let him squirm for another five I'm minutes. I'm squirming, I'm squirming. But I, I started carrying these with me into my life, and I maybe have to apologize to any girlfriends who may watch this somewhere down the road if I was overly romantic and had gestures and nuance that you probably didn't pick up on. I got it from this fella. <laughs> but I know where that came from for me. And it was, it was these, your books, your stories. And it has educated me in a beautiful way as I've gone on with my relationships. And even as I raise my son and I talk to him about gentleness and, and you know, and, and we, as we're, he's 11, so we're, we're just getting there, okay? <laughs> as we're, we're exploring these themes. So I'm aware where it came from for me, but where did it come from for you that you, where, where, where did this sense of romance and your desire to tell these kind of stories come from? Well, there's a couple of different things embedded in what you're saying. First of all, that's a lovely thing to hear. It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing to hear. The idea of uh, drama and romance and intensity came from my love of reading, books that embodied those. I was a reader from four or five years old, and I was just omnivorously devouring these stories. The idea that, this is the other half of what you brought up, uh, respect for people, honor, the fact that the world can be hellish and miserable, but not everyone in it is hellish and miserable. The fact that there are individual choices, decisions, commitments we may make to resist the hellishness of the time the story set in, and then by extension the time we're living in, these are things that matter to me. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a vogue today in certain treatments of history and the fantastic, even contemporary fiction, that stresses the hellish miserability you actually heard me say that. <laughs> the hellish miserability, and I'm copywriting that one, wow. of the way things were and the way things are, and that it's more realistic to show how vicious and savage people are to each other. And they are. And if you've read me, you're going to have seen them being that way to each other. But this ties in with what I said before about not accepting the either-or of things. Maybe that's central to how I, I look at things. Maybe you, you're steering. I haven't thought this through. But the idea that we so patly, simplistically say, well, it's either this or that. And I'm someone who's inclined to say, why can't it be both? Why can't we show the violence and anger of a society, and some people setting themselves against that. And by the way, that's absolutely embedded in any understanding of the Renaissance, that we have our image of Michelangelo and da Vinci and Raphael, and we have the cathedrals, and we have the glittering sophistication, and we've got some savagely brutal warfare. And in that savagely brutal warfare, it's in here, who were the casualties 95% of the time? They're not 
the aristocrats hiring the armies. They're not the leaders of the armies. They're not even most of the time the soldiers in the armies unless they got dysentery, and I don't mean that flippantly. Disease killed far more people in warfare situations than the actual war did. The victims were the farmers whose fields were trampled by horses, whose crops were raided by armies, because the armies lived on the land. They lived on what they gleaned as they went through, and they were paid by rape and pillage. That's how they were sustained. That's how you kept your army. So that idea of trying to show both the ugliness and the honor and glory and redemption and hope that are, for me, part of existence had been running through all of the books and in some way the setting of this one was a natural for what I like to do. So let's talk a little bit about choice, the power of choice as a character um, versus fate. There's a, a brilliant quote by an amazing writer, maybe you'll recognize it, it goes something like this. There are no wrong turnings. Only paths we had not known we were meant to take. You're having so much <laughs> fun, aren't you? <laughs> um, so let's talk about that, your, your opinion of personal choice versus fate. And uh, I, I know you use it in the books, but maybe you can talk about both within the well, books and for yourself. That's again, we're back to the dichotomy thing, right? Our choice or random chance or destiny, we're back to some people saying either or, and I'm sitting here saying, why not all? Why not a mixture? Why not some moments in our life that are absolutely our choice and some moments in our life where we happen to linger in a hallway two or three minutes longer than we normally would have and our life has changed by having stayed in that hallway for two or three minutes. That engages me again as showing the tension and flux mm -hmm. between how our lives play out. We don't actually like it, Chris. We don't like feeling that randomness or accident can play such a large role in what happens. But if you think about it, your 23 years old and you go into a bar on a Friday night and you go to the far end of the bar and you meet someone and you meet someone and you end up raising a family with that person for the next 30 years and if you've gone into the near end of the crowded bar you don't meet that person now you will have a light you will meet someone else with luck, but you don't have that life because you walk to the far end of the bar. And that's embedded in our existence. At the same time, something happens, something that puts you on the spot, whether you are dealing with the American or Canadian elections this year and next, whether you are in Vichy, France, and have to make moral choices about collaborating or resisting, whether you do something bad because your children are starving, we're always actually making choices as well. So I like writing in a way that lets the reader think about how both of these things come mm -hmm. up for us. And I think we all feel that when we read it. Um, I think that a lot of that dichotomy or that balance that you've strived to create is, and I'm going back to my own personal experience again, is, is in many ways informed me through, because through, I read it at such an early time, of the balance between like God, not God, religion, not religion, experience, choice. And, but what I always liked about what you do is the mysticalness that you bring to your work. And that's that, and I know it's been the, the quarter turn to fantasy that people talk about your work. And I've always loved that because it allows you, us to believe in the magic 
which can also be in the spirit, in the possibilities, in all of, in the things that are outside of the tangible. And I think that that, that tightrope that you've been walking with, trying to create that in your books is, anyway, for me it's really paid off in terms of me being able to pretend I'm a Viking or a werewolf or whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Um, Chris, let me, let me pick up on that because there's something really interesting in this. So, a number of years ago, I'm reading a biography of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And the biographer says, we need a working definition of magic realism. And I had always been saying for years that magic realism is a genre where a literary person is reading a fantasy and likes it. <laughs> and wants to attach a better label that makes him or her feel better about their liking it. But the definition of magic realism that was offered in the biography of Marquez is the novel presents the world as the characters in the book believe it to be, without any sense that the writer finds it quaint or amusing. And I read this and said, my God, I've been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> you know, it's the idea of the spiritual or the supernatural, the fantastical. If I'm presenting you 6th century Byzantium or Alfred the Great and the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings and the Celts. One of the ways I draw you in, you were talking about being drawn in, one of the ways I think I can draw you in is by making the world be as the people in the story understood it. So if they think that there are fairies in the woods to the west of Wessex, or whatever equivalent, I will put them there. If the people thought that cursed tablets and graves in 6th century Byzantium would become valid and real, they would work if you threw it in an open grave before the grave was covered up, I will do that. And one of the things that does, along with your feeling that you are immersed in the setting, mm -hmm. One of the other things it does that I really like, if I do it right, is it removes our 21st century sense of superiority, of smugness. They were so strange what they believed back then. They thought in ancient China that if you didn't bury someone after they died, their ghost would live forever as a ghost in the spot where they died until the bones were buried. Isn't that charming? Well, no, it's not. Or it's not if you're doing a story about those people and you want the reader to empathize with and engage with and be consumed by those people. You make it real. It's how I've been operating for over 20 years with a view to trying to bring you in by doing it that way. Well, I think that's one of the great alchemies that's working within your books because, yes, we do get caught in our modern world of our screens and we get so disconnected from, from nature in, in so many of its manifestations. And who's to say that the spirit realm was or wasn't different back then? The electromagnetic energy may be playing with our minds and, you know, yada, yada, yada. We, all of our sci-fi fantasy people were just loving this stuff, right? But honestly, the that alchemy that you brought to that allowed me to connect with the spirit world or the spiritual, the magic. And I use magic in a very broad terms. I don't mean like fireballs. I mean the magic of life, the, 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 the things that are intangible, the, the nuance, the, 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 the thing the, that's greater than the sum of the, the meal, the words, all those things, you know, that that somehow you've managed to awaken within, I think, a lot of your readers. Would you, you guys agree? Readers, yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. I, it's not really a question, it's more a self observation <laughs> And yes, Jorge is definitely giving me the wrap it up sign. Um, I just wanna know if there's one, 
I guess this is this is a quick one, but then there are no quick ones. No, this, this paths is, we have this, not this, known we were meant to This take. is a quick one. It occurred to me as I looked through all of your books, and we we are talking about that they are separate entities. And is there a chronology that you would recommend to readers if for first time readers coming to your books? Yep. What I usually do. What I usually do, if somebody says, where do I start? I've never read you. I'm a terrible human being, but I've never read you. And what I will usually do is ask what interests them. Mm -hmm. What periods of the past, what places, where they'd like to travel, where they have traveled. I will also ask if they are lovers of Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, because then you could start with Fiona but if that's not your orientation as a reader, I will usually simply say, start with the setting that engages you the most. And that's the easiest way in. I don't think there's any uh, through line or straight line in the books. Yeah, I, I was just curious. You know, maybe of your own sort of liking to one book or another. Just digging.